So I want to end this unit on the chemical properties of fresh waters, where we've really been focusing a lot on oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus, and also have had some discussion about trophic status of lakes. Um, I want to end this unit with a, a look at eutrophication in the Mississippi River Basin, because we've learned a lot about the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And I want to look at what's happening throughout the basin um, with regards to nitrogen and phosphorus and how that's impacting what's happening further downstream. Later in the semester, when we start talking about uh, global change, uh, we will revisit eutrophication and talk about ways to mitigate and to restore our ecosystems that have been eutrophied, but we'll wait on that for later in the semester. So when we talk about nitrogen and phosphorus loading in our fresh waters, we know that it really has to do with what's happening in the watershed. And so if you look at a really big scale at the whole Mississippi River Basin and look at what's happening with land use across the basin, we can see on this map that predominantly throughout the, um, throughout the watershed, we have a lot of agriculture. So in this figure, um, again, the, the Mississippi River Basin is outlined here. It's a very large river basin. It's draining over 40% of the continental United States. And, um, and we've learned a lot about what's happening at the headwaters. But as we look downstream from, from the headwaters, what's going on? And we can see that uh, a lot of this light green color throughout the watershed, that means that those areas are agriculture, lots and lots of farms. Uh, we also have in the western part of the basin more uh, rangeland or barren land, so maybe where there's more livestock. Um, and then the red areas are urban areas, as, and then we have some woodlands, um, primarily in the Appalachians. And um, so the predominant land use in the basin is agriculture. And if we kind of zoom in on the upper Mississippi River Basin, so that's the portion of the river uh, basin that we live in, um, this is a sub, sub watershed within the larger Mississippi River watershed. So we've learned about how watersheds are delineated and they can be delineated at different scales. And so this is sort of a smaller scale watershed um, that we are part of. So we're part of the upper Mississippi River Basin up here um, as the headwaters, down here as the Twin Cities. And you can see this is the upper Mississippi River watershed. And so if you look sort of at the smaller scale, we see a similar situation. So um, the majority of the uh, land use in the upper Mississippi River Basin is agricultural. Um, the further north you go, the more forested it is. And again, up in the headwaters, that's what, what it's like. There's a lot of forest up there. Um, but as you go further downstream, um, and particularly, for example, the Minnesota River, uh, which we learned about when we learned about Bedote, uh, and looked at the confluence with the Minnesota River and the Mississippi, the Minnesota flows right through here. That river flows through all agricultural land. So it's a, got a very different uh, watershed and a different water quality for, from the water that's running down from northern Minnesota. So the upper Mississippi River uh, Basin, uh, the, the river runs about 1,300 miles down through, um, down through this basin um, until it, it meets the Ohio River. And then from there, it goes on to its next sub-watershed. So really, it's, it's a very significant part of the river in terms of river miles. It's over half the length of the entire Mississippi. Um, there are all these other rivers that feed in that are tributaries. Um, but if you just follow what we call the Mississippi River, over half of that the river's length is in, um, in our basin. And um, so then if you look at this figure here, it's the same thing. So looking at the entire basin, and then this dark black outline shows the upper Mississippi River Basin. And here we've overlaid um, the nitrogen yields. That means how much nitrogen is coming off of the land and going um, into our waterways. Um, and it's measured in kilograms per square kilometer per year. And so the areas in red and pink are delivering more nitrogen than other areas that are green, yellow, and blue. And it's essentially the quantity of, of nitrogen that's lost from land into, into the flowing water. And you can see that all of the red and, well, most of the red and most of the pink, the, the areas, the sub, these, are, these little, um, shapes here are even smaller watersheds within the upper Mississippi River Basin. 
these watersheds predominantly fall within that basin where we live, right? So we're right about here. Um, you know, the headwaters has very little um, or, well, not the smallest amount because there is some agricultural practice up there. Um, and really the reality is, is that we have nitrogen entering our waterways uh, naturally as well. So different landscapes will contribute nitrogen differently to, to uh, runoff. Um, but as you go downstream, you can see we have a lot of agricultural practices that result in a lot of nitrogen loading in, um, into the Mississippi River. So when we've been talking about eutrophication, we've been really talking about what's happening in lakes um, because we don't really think of rivers as being eutrophied because they're flowing water. Um, but the reality is, is that water is all flowing right downstream and all those nutrients are being carried along with it. And um, here is looking at uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus loads in um, different sub-basins in the Mississippi. So again, the upper Mississippi River Basin is where we are. There's also the Missouri Platte, the Ohio, Tennessee, the Arkansas Red, and the lower Mississippi. So these are different sub-basins. And you can see that um, you know, if you total this up, it's 100% of the uh, total nitrogen that's being contributed to the river. And this is the uh, total phosphorus but it's dividing it into sub-basins. And you can see that the upper Mississippi and the Ohio, Tennessee sub-basins contribute the most um, nitrogen to the river. Um, and the upper Mississippi and the Ohio, Tennessee also contribute the most phosphorus to the river. So if you kind of go back to this, the Ohio, Tennessee is gonna be going through here, right? So it's pulling nitrogen and phosphorus from these watersheds. Um, the upper Mississippi River Basin is pulling nitrogen and phosphorus from these watersheds. Um, so the bottom line is we are contributing a lot of nutrients to the system as it's flowing downstream. And that's because, again, of the agricultural practices in our watersheds. Um, in Minnesota, we are seeing that more so in the western uh, part of the state, southwestern part of the state, uh, whereas further north, we're not having as much agricultural practices that are um, contributing those nutrient loads to the system. So who cares, right? Why are we talking about this anyways? I'm gonna to get to that. Um, let's see, the one thing I want you to take away from this slide is uh, the, the percentage increase um, in nitrogen loading in, in the Mississippi River since um, 1950. So because of uh, agricultural fertilizer uh, additions to the landscape, we've seen a 1,600% increase in nitrogen in our waterways. So it's a huge, huge amount of um, nitrogen that's been put out into onto the landscape and is running off into our systems. Um, not gonna spend too much time on that, but I do wanna talk about the who cares, right? So why do we care so much about eutrophication? Well, we know it causes algal blooms, right? Uh, but what are the other impacts of eutrophication? Um, so we also have learned that you know, eutroph eutrophication in general, natural eutrophication and cultural eutrophication results in shallower basins. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, as a water body becomes more eutrophied, the, the water body becomes shallower. It tends to become warmer as well because the, um, there's less water and so it's gonna warm more quickly than a deeper basin. Um, so the high nutrient levels are going to result in lots of phytoplankton, um, less light penetration, less dissolved oxygen. We've talked about all of that. Um, and ultimately, it's going to impact the food web that's found in these systems. So you can look at sort of who, who are the predominant species of fish that are found in, a, in the ligotrophic lake and what are the predominant species found in a eutrophic lake. Now, a hyper-eutrophic lake might not have any fish at all, right? Because the system might become completely anoxic and have a fish kill. Um, but there are species of fish that can tolerate low oxygen, um, not no oxygen, but can tolerate low oxygen. Uh, but those are gonna be different than the species that need cool, well-oxygenated water. And so as humans, we appreciate uh, fish, right? We like to fish and a lot of people um, like to fish for certain species, right? And we like to have a diversity of species that we like to fish for. So, uh, you know, in a, a legotrophic lake, you're gonna find more smallmouth bass, lake trout, um, pike, sturgeon, whitefish, these, these fish that we tend to associate with our Minnesota lakes. Um, in a more eutrophied lake, you're gonna find species like carp and bullhead and catfish that are more tolerant of the conditions in the lake. 
So it's not like the lake is dead when it's eutrophied, it's just different. And again, if we have all of our lakes become eutrophic, we're gonna lose habitat for these other species. So we need to make sure we are uh, managing our landscape so that we don't have every single water body becoming eutrophic or hyper-eutrophic because that would really change um, the fish communities and the fish diversity that we have throughout our water bodies. Uh, one last thing I just want to point out, and this for those of you who, and some of this is probably familiar for those of you who've taken environmental science already, um, but this concept of biological oxygen demand, um, this is actually a, a, a figure that looks at the distance downstream from a sewage spill, so where you have like a huge pulse of nutrients entering a system, um, an aquatic system, and it looks at the um, concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water. So here you is the point in the stream where you have had the spill. And um, as you go downstream, you can see that the um, biological oxygen demand peaks right at the spill. Biological oxygen demand is essentially a measure of how much uh, respiration is happening in the system, how much demand is there, biologically speaking, for oxygen, how much oxygen is being consumed. Um, and so there's a, a peak in biological oxygen demand, and then as you go downstream from the sewage spill, um, it, it decreases. Um, this green line shows the dissolved oxygen. So here, you know, there's this peak in dissolved oxygen demand, and eventually the oxygen is depleted from the water. And it shows that at a certain point, um, if the oxygen gets too low, it will cause a fish kill. And so you can see where the um, BOD, the biological oxygen, oxygen demand dips so low that um, at this point in the stream, you can imagine that there would be a fish kill. Um, and then slowly the stream recovers, the dissolved oxygen goes back up and, um, and yeah, it's, it, it's a different situation as the further you get from that spill. So this, the reason I'm showing this is just to kind of reiterate the, the really strong influence that respiration and um, uh, that, you know, basically these oxygen dynamics that can happen because of the addition of nutrients to a system. The reason for this increase in biological oxygen demand is, is because you have so much productivity, but you also have so much decomposition happening. And you have to think about those dynamics of what's happening with oxygen. Um, and if you think about an even bigger scale, um, you know, if you look at what's happening in the Mississippi River, we're eutrophying the whole system. That water is all flowing downstream to the Gulf of Mexico. And um, all along through the Gulf of Mexico, we have this dead zone um, that's, that's happening um, because basically we're depleting the water of oxygen um, at the Gulf of Mexico, at the mouth of the river. So we're eutrophying the, the actually the ocean and that's causing fish kills and dead zones right at, at, the, at the Gulf. Um, the reason I show this bigger scale uh, map, just not, not just the Mississippi, but to show where there are biological uh, dead zones throughout the world, right? So in lots of different locations around the world. Um, it's not just uh, unique to the Mississippi River Basin that um, we have, because of our agricultural practices across throughout the globe, really, we have changed water quality to such an extent that we're impacting what's happening, happening in, in the ocean. So it's all kind of a bleak picture. Um, you know, when you think about a dead zone, we're talking about fish kills and, and not just a change in fish species composition, but actually things are dying. Um, we will be talking again later in the semester about ways we can fix this and we can um, restore systems to be uh, more resilient and to um, recover from eutrophication. It's not an easy, easy prospect, but there has been a lot of work done on how to manage these systems. So we will revisit this. And that is all I'm going to say about eutrophication.